Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Mega for this conference. Pleased to be here. At the outset, I would say, as I surveyed the jurisdictions around the world, civil law countries and common law countries, we will talk about. One thing which was constant in systems which have made progress to combat alienation is knowledge, conferences, and more decisions. That has been the common denominator to progress. So let's hope this conference is going to make that advance here. <coughs> Parental alienation is an expression of human behavior. The behaviors are common, and no matter where you look at the world, they are similar. You can look at India, Germany, Brazil, US, UK. The labels could be different, but the behaviors are the same. How each system has intervened to take uh, notice of these behaviors and combat them, there is a wide disparity. But no doubt about it, these behaviors are the same. From a legal practitioner's standpoint, as lawyers, we look at the work done by the giants in this field. And one giant that we owe the debt to is obviously Dr. Richard Rodman. But there are many of researchers who have, who have published, talked about, and continue to advance the science in this field. Some of them are in this room as well. And as a practitioner, I also acknowledge a reality. Often I'm in a court where a particular judge seems to have a biased view. Could be about what he or she believes about Dr. Gardner could be about what he or she believes about another expert. Well, I adopt an approach to this. As a child growing up in India, in a traditional Hindu family, I learned we had hundreds of gods and goddesses. So if you pray to an elephant god and that doesn't work out, you simply move to the next god. <laughs> Until the prayer works out. <laughs> So, if there is a judge who seems to have some biased view, misinforma misinformation about, let's say, Dr. Gardner, I can fight with that. Because I want a realistic remedy for my client, who is a target candidate. I want that judge to order reunification. I want that judge to order some sort of protective measures. Put the alienator in jail which I have been able to do. Financial sanctions, no contract orders. So I pick something else. Maybe I will leave with Dr. Bernard as an expert, talk about Dr. Baker's theory and her research. I don't get wedded to a particular idea or a particular theory because labels at the end of the day don't matter. Let's look at the jurisdictions. So, at the risk of gross oversimplification, the systems in the world fall between civil law and common law. And the civil law systems are Germany, Brazil, Italy, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and common law are basically based on the British common law, which are former colonies of the UK, uh, India, US, Australia, Canada. Now, Unfortunate labels have been put to the systems as adversarial versus inquisitorial. And generally speaking, common law systems are the adversarial systems, which interestingly dates back in the Germanic trial. Even though Germany is a civil law system, the common law system originates from Germany. This is a system where the judge is basically a moderator. Two parties are gladiators. The barrister, trial lawyers, advocates, people call them different names, they basically fight it out in the courtroom. Dad's lawyer versus mom's lawyer. The judge is not tasked with identification of evidence. The judge basically puts the rules of the game on the duck and moderates it. It's up to a particular party's lawyer to identify evidence, to make sure he or she uses the right expert, to take the initiative, to file appropriate motion, to make sure the research put before the court is cutting edge and is appropriate. So if you happen to have a weak lawyer, 
a lawyer who doesn't understand parental alienation, a lawyer who is not willing to go an extra mile, you suffer. In the civil law systems, the judge is basically the high priest. He or she has an independent obligation to search for the truth. The judge identifies what evidence matters, what does not. Another thing, in common law, judges basically make the law. They don't write the law, but when they make a decision, that decision, depending on the court, is binding on the next judge. So they have a precedent to fall. In civil law system, we don't have those things. In civil law systems, the judges are also very, very prone, they're very much prone to look at their experts. They appoint an expert, and they are willing to listen to that expert, and if you present another expert to counter, or comment, or rebut the other judge's expert, it's not liked, it's frowned upon. It's perfectly acceptable in common law systems, not in civil law systems. In parental alienation cases, you find in the US, UK, Canada, Korea, it often boils down to the back of experts. You have one expert on the stand who's talking about, well, it's science, there is reliability, there's validity to alienation, that finds, here's how it happens, here are the intervention measures. Another expert gets on the stand saying it's absolutely nonsense, the theory was ended up by Richard Gardner, purely anecdotal evidence, nothing in fact alienation exists, it's junk science. The judge is going to decide which one to trust. Which expert and which theory has more credibility, validity, and reliability? In civil law, the judges don't have the battle of experts. They're going to pick one expert and listen to him or her. Social workers get involved. The system just works differently. So unless there's a grassroots movement, unless there's vibrant discussion among the professional community, unless the social workers who are involved in these cases at the very ground level, they are educated and they know what to look for, they know what the initial is. Progress is not made. Let's take a brief tour around the world. Brazil, 2011, the law of 2010, sorry, it was the first country to pass legislation against alienation, continues to take steps 2017. There's another law that was passed which calls alienation as psychological violence, subject to criminal penalties and criminal contempt. Interestingly, the term psychological violence, last week, Court of Appeals in Minnesota, US, used a similar phrase to overturn a trial court's refusal to hold an evidentiary hearing on the issue of alienation. And the Court of Appeals in Minnesota say, parental alienation is psychological kidnapping. And the judge must hold an evidentiary hearing when a parent complains about it. France, lots of publication, translated publications, conferences, grassroots movement, organizations which are very much advanced, cases from the France as well, Supreme Court has recognized parental alienation as an abusive behavior, justifying change of custody, continues to make progress. Germany, a little bit of odd duck. Unfortunately, in 2001, a political article by Earl Brook found its way in the handbook that's on every judge's desk in Germany. And that article referred to alienation as junk science. Since then, there's been some sort of a don't ask, don't tell. We are not going to mention the word alienation. We can talk about the behaviors, but let's not use that term. And it's sort of an unfortunate development in Germany. The other problem in Germany is uh, what I like to call the voice of the child issue. Child, child's preference is given terrific amount of deference. And that simply is unfortunately an alienation case. There was a case which was appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, the famous case with Leiter versus Germany. And the European Court of Human Rights referred to the German Court of Decision, and I will quote, the German Court of Appeal held 
it is up to the mother to overcome her aversion to the father, and up to the father to learn that contact can only be reinstated through patience, restraint, and understanding of both the mother's and child's feelings. That's nonsense. In an alienation case, the child is going to be 18 or 20 and out of the parent's life. If they don't to intervene. But unfortunately, the European Court of Human Rights didn't intervene, and the dissenting opinion was stated in a criticism of the German Court of Appeals. And the judges wrote, the child was clearly in a loyalty conflict with the mother. I don't believe they used the term alienation, but they used the term loyalty conflict. And the German courts were not justified to suspend contact without a time limit. The national authorities should have taken active measures in order for the father to see his daughter, and even more importantly, for the daughter to see her father. Fortunately, we're going to talk more about it. Recent cases of the European Court of Human Rights are very promising. We talked about voice of child, <coughs> Italy, good cases change of custody, in cases of alienation, uh, research organizations. One of the recent developments in Italy is a program for the product. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking to one of our audience here, members, about how it's implemented. And the power is based on reunification. After a court finding of alienation, how to reunify a child who has been alienated with the target parent. And it's also been uh, worked by one of the members of PFG, Dr. Marco Pinzitore. The progress uh, remains to see how it turns out, but it's very promising development. Israel, two systems, rabbinical courts and secular family courts. Both have identified and acknowledged parental alienation. Both have intervened. There are several decisions in 2017 and in 2018 which have changed custody to count alienation, which have held a parent in contempt. And interestingly, in maybe it's just my reading of the cases of the cases that I found, but fathers have to be have found to be alienators more and more, in the, at least from the cases that I've seen in Israel. Mexico, uh, the states in Mexico have legislated against alienation. Different provinces have taken initiatives. There isn't a national legislation, but the states have done it. And the cases continue to come, which have held alienation as child abuse, change of custody required. Spain, we talked in the morning about that, we're going to again into that. But uh, cases again have intervened, change of custody, reunification. Therapy. Speaking of therapy, there seems to be misunderstanding in some, some of the cases where the judge believes that it's appropriate to send a child to therapy and then basically everything will be cured. Not enough effort is made to figure out what therapy, if any at all, can be considered in alienation cases. And I don't seem to see any follow-up as to whether it worked. Or well, there is a, another appeal of that, but how it's enforced. Many jurisdictions, unfortunately, do not have or do not like to enforce contempt powers. And that is required in an alienation case. If you have a court order, be it about parenting time, about reunification, the court must have power to enforce its orders, otherwise, it becomes a farce. And the jurisdictions that have made progress have not shied away from enforcing contempt powers. European Court of Human Rights, two great cases, 2017. One against Croatia, another against Bulgaria. Both cases, the courts have sent back to the national authorities saying that it was a violation of Article 6 and 8 and 13 of the <coughs> to not intervene. The national authorities were simply lazy. In one case, in the Bulgaria case, all they did was to hold meetings and conferences, trying to cajole one parent into cooperating with the other. But no solid plan, no contempt mechanism, no proper intervention. In the Croatian case, 
It's important because if we go back to Germany, the Croatian authority is relying on the child's preference. When the child doesn't want to see a parent, the child has a preference, the child's voice must be heard. And the European Court of Human Rights criticized that approach. The child's view must be taken into account and given due weight, of course, but it does not entail an unconditional veto power. <coughs> If a court has to base a decision on the views of the children who are palpably unable to form an articulate opinion as to their wishes, for example, because of a loyalty conflict, such a decision would run contrary to Article 8 of the Convention. It's an obligation of means for a nation, not a result, and must require preparatory and phased measures. The court has to inquire why is a child refusing to see a parent. Why is the child refusing to acknowledge a relationship? Why is the child behaving in a certain way? You just can't rely on the child's word. In the US decisions, sometimes the court refers to this as diminished capacity. And the guardians at Lighten, or Liner's Council, different system, we call it differently, but the lawyers who are appointed for the children have a distinct and a unique obligation to advocate for the child's best interests. Not what the child wants. They're not supposed to be the child's mouthpiece. In which jurisdiction is this? United States. I have had a case, a troublesome case in New York, where the child absolutely did not want to have any relationship with the parent and was adamant about it. The guardian filed a terrific brief in the court and told the court, my client wishes me to tell you that she doesn't want to see her father ever for the rest of her life. However, having said that, I am advocating for the precisely opposite reason. And here's why. And she laid out the entire theory of parental alienation and why the court should change stuff to deal with the child between the father. And the court just did that. And that's needed. And these two decisions are stepping in the right direction to the European Court of Human Rights. India, terrific opinion in 2017 from the Supreme Court of India. Again, talking about child's preference, but also talking about a father who was a alienator in this case, who had repeatedly violated protective orders, repeatedly violated parenting time orders from the trial court. And then argued the child has been living with me for so long. Why rock the boat? You know, the child didn't want to see the mother, the father was an army officer. There's a lot of it was a lot of political controversial cases as well. And the court said, no, 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 let's wait a minute. You cannot be the beneficiary of your own wrongs. <laughs> <laughs> The Supreme Court said the children are not playmates, they are not chattels to be just sent back and forth between the parents. Interestingly, the Supreme Court cited Dr. Gardner's 1985 paper on parental alienation. Didn't seem to consider any of the research, the recent one, but just focused on that article and referred to parental alienation syndrome as well. And since it's the highest score in India, it's binding on all courts across the country. So that's a significant decision. Australia, uh, great cases. The 2016 case was one of the important cases where the court found alienation but was unwilling to reverse or do anything, or reverse the custody order, or do anything about it because the children were 12 and 17. And the court basically said, too late. Some courts have disagreed with that approach, by the way, but this particular court did not determine. And there was an argument made by the alienators expert that parental alienation as a theory and a science has been thoroughly discredited in the world. To which the expert opinion by the target parent, which the court ultimately adopted, say, you have completely misunderstood it. What has been debunked is the idea that there is this neat box called parental alienation syndrome. It's quite clear, there's absolutely no doubt at all, 
that children can lose a relationship with a parent because of actions of the other parent. You don't need to get fixated on the label. You can call it Timbuktu if you want. <laughs> but as long as those behaviors are there, and the courts across the world are focused on the behaviors, we need intervention. New Zealand, great cases as well. Uh, terms pathological alienation mentioned a lot instead of parental alienation, but same concept, intervention as well, change of custody. Canada. In my opinion, this is a powerhouse of the country that has terrific decisions and have done everything possible to combat alienation. Three things about Canada. First, the trial decisions are all published, which is a unique thing. If it's easy to get hold of, there's a central database. They are exceptionally well written and researched, which gives you great information. Two, the court orders are enforced by Canadian judges. And three, Canadian judges are absolutely willing to consider cutting edge research, opinions from different provinces. You can cite an opinion from British Columbia in you know, Ontario. They will welcome it. They will also look at the US opinions, English opinions, and willing to consider outside the horizons, which is a big thing in developing law about it. I do want to thank Brian Bumper, a Canadian lawyer, who was exceptionally helpful to me and uh, made me understand how the Canadian system works. Fantastic lawyer does good work for operating the United States cases. UK. Good and bad. The good thing is that decisions are good. People talk about parental alienation. Judges have that alienation in their decisions. They have tried to intervene, change custody, put some measures in place, all of that. Excellent work by many experts. Nick Child, you can as well, Karen Woodall. Scotland's different. Well, I call it UK. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, there's a geographical disparity. You look at decisions coming out of Greater London area, and then you look at a decision from, let's say, Newcastle, and it's like night and day. Sometimes judges in some remote provinces who may not have that sophistication in terms of research available or help from experts don't make good decisions. In some cases, the decision is excellent. So it boils down to, in my opinion, the services provided to the judges uh, by Kafkas and social workers. And often the theory is advanced that, well, we need to listen to the child, we need to take an age in consideration, we need to have baby steps here, treat softly, don't make any rash decisions, and delay after delay after delay. By the way, that's a single most uh, common ground in appeals before the European Court of Human Rights unbearable delay. And that's what the courts are frowned upon. That if there's an accusation, which is commonly abuse, the target parent is abusing, that's why the child doesn't want to see your him or her. The European Court of Human Rights and other courts in the US and Canada have held, well, let's make a finding. Give them a day in the court, give them a shot at proving the evidence, but let's make a finding, because if it's indeed abuse, then yes, it's not alienation, and we need to look into it. But if the allegations are false, they are orchestrated, well, that's an alienating behavior in itself. And we need to look at that. US decisions, great uh, chapter by Dr. Durandos in this book, which is a terrific survey of uh, North American law, Canada, and US decisions, case by case basis. And a CD that goes to the book contains every case where a custody was changed to the target parent because of alienation. So, what are the common remedies that you find typically in the United States and Canada, and also in the UK sometimes? Reversal of custody, reversal of custody coupled with a no contact period between the alienator and the child to allow the target parent to get appropriate mental health intervention. Some courts, for example, Michigan courts, call it some reparative parenting time. 
because of legal reasons, sometimes it's difficult to change custody without going through a detailed trial, making findings of fact, and it's, it involves a lot of time and effort. And sometimes the court hold a mini trial, a trial nonetheless, but a smaller, on a smaller scale to just focus on one particular allegation, let's say abuse or alienating behavior. And the court orders the therapy parenting time putting the child with the, with the target parent, with mental health intervention, and having a no contact order in place where the alien effort cannot influence the child. And the courts then have review hearings to see how it's going. Criminal sanctions, uh, including jail time for the alien parent. It's not because now they, are, they are not sent to jail because they engage in alienation. Usually, the criminal sanctions are put in place because there are violations of court orders, usually parenting time. And the target parent excuses that, well, I don't want to force my child to go and see the other parent. I just don't believe that. He or she has an independent mind. We don't yes. believe in force. That's not my parenting side. And uh, make it happen. And the courts have said, well, well, we will make it happen. After you go to jail, and the kid goes to the target parent, and after 30 days, you can come out and we've thought about what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Some courts, in New York, for example, they held suspension of alimony for the Indian state, for alienation as well. Tort actions, orders of protection, reallocation of legal costs, making the, car, making the alienator pay for the legal fees and costs of their target parent. This is a big deal in America because American the system requires each party to bear their own costs. There is no reallocation cost. Such sometimes in England, the winner has to the basically the loser has to pay the winner's fees. In US, even though you can prove alienation and you get appropriate remedy, the cost is so high by the time you get done with it. Lawyers, experts, every evidentiary hearings, trials. Rebuttal experts, appeals, it's outrageously expensive. The courts are starting to really look at the cost now. What do we need? Lawyers need to be made aware of the phenomenon. They need special training. In a lot of federal jurisdictions, there's mandatory continuing legal education. The American Bar Association is putting a program, the parallel section of working programs together. So they need to go to this program, we need to spread the word. Same with the judges. I can't tell you how many times after a contentious, nasty court hearing back and forth, the dueling expert, the judge calls the lawyers back into the chambers, sits us down and says, folks, can you be civil, please? Let's find a way out. I want to help this child, but I'm not going to just take the child and send the dad along the jail and send the bailiffs and put them through some program, put them on a plane, send them a program, I just don't want to be in the front page of the local newspaper. Yeah. What if the kid dies? What if the kid runs away? Tries to kill himself or herself. And at that point in time, you can cite all the research you want, that statistically that has not happened. The chances are very low, but some judges just don't do that. And that's a problem. That's a real problem, and we need to address that. Social services, uh, they have to be trained. CPS workers, Child Protective Services in America, CAFCAS in the UK, uh, CYS in Canada. They need to proper, have a proper understanding of what alienation is, what works, what doesn't work, how not to rush to judgment in cases of alienation of abuse, but to basically walk through it carefully. Intervention. What works? That's a million dollar question. And that's when I, if I am an expert on the stand, I try to have a significant part of the testimony focus on that. Because judges are really not that much interested in whose fault it is. They want solutions. They want to make sure that the parent is not going to be back in my court in next week screaming again, alienation or whatnot. And what can we do about it? And then, that time, an expert who can walk the court through programs that have worked, which have peer-reviewed success studies published, 
who can assure the court this has been done, it's been done well, it has worked. Judges sit back and take notice. That needs to happen. So what's ahead for Norway and Sweden? Well, one thing, more conferences like this, absolutely. Uh, give and take of uh, sharing of knowledge between the judges. I'd be very happy to have the US judges talk to Swedish judges or Norwegian judges if they can make a conference happen. Because it's unique and very helpful for a judge in a jurisdiction which frowns upon the alienation is skeptical of it, to hear about struggles from judges who have been there and done that. Just Lord Justice McFarlane in a recent speech talked about there is no there's been debate about whether or not the holy grail of parental alienation syndrome actually exists. But it really doesn't matter. I readily accept that in some cases a parent can either deliberately or inadvertently turn the mind of the child against the other parent. So the child holds a holy negative view of the other parent. That's I, that I accept. And I don't really care about whether syndrome exists or not. Similar pronouncement from a judge in Massachusetts. Judge Rule. Parental alienation syndrome focuses solely on the behavior and actions of the child. As contrasted with the concept of parental alienation, which instead focuses on the behavior and actions of the aligned parent, rejected parent, and the child or the children. And crucially, when the parent from this matter study the general acceptance of the concept of strategies. And that's what more and more studies are focusing on. That the debate is over, folks. We no longer care about the label of syndrome. What we do care about are those behaviors. Is the parent consistently bad mouthing the other parent in front of the child? Is the parent consistently flouting and violating the court order parenting time orders? Is the parent continuously encouraging the child to reject the other parent by actions, by words, by deeds, errors of commission, errors of omission, and the courts look at that. And they want to get evidence. So what are some concerns that are creeping up? Well, I identify them in mainly three categories. One are pro se litigants, which are basically parents who don't have lawyers and are imprisoning themselves in court. And sometimes, inadvertently, they end up making bad law. There's a case which was an unfortunate case out of the UK Castle in the matter of B, where the judge wrote a really good opinion that the father, against all evidence to the contrary, had, in the court's words, with granite-like certainty, there was a case of simple alienation. That everyone in the case, all social workers, all experts, all judges, just got it wrong. He was the only one who knew what they thought about. Alienation and nothing else. And in father's words, I have studied alienation for five years and know a lot about it. So these cases at times, without proper evidence, end up making bad law. Other problem that's coming up are people going on social media. After one bad decision or some frustration, they just out, they express their outrage on Facebook, on other sites, and amassing judges, guardians, minors counsel. And that never helps. It usually goes to the contrary. Other concern is, this is the UK cases mainly, which have held alienation cases to be intractable cases or inflexible hostility and basically throwing the power. We can't really do anything about it because the kid's 15 year old. Too late, it's truly done, something truly done five years ago, now we can't really do anything about it. So basically, target parents, sorry, thank you for your troubles, but sorry, can't do anything about it. Contrast that approach to Canadian decisions, where the court says a court should never give up on a child's need to have a close relationship with both of their parents, regardless of the child's age. That's a distinction in Canada. And I wish you'd see more cases like that in the US and the UK as well. Third category, which is concerning, is the approach uh, which the court itself puts it, 
softly, softly. And this was a decision uh, criticizing half care social workers' approach. The let's take baby steps. Let's start with the lunches, trips to the ice cream shop, see how the target parent does. And if the child is okay, we can progress to maybe having parenting time overnight here and there. And months go by. There's always an excuse as to why the parent is not perfect, why he or she is not good enough. And the courts now are criticizing that approach. So that's a good sign. A chilling factor in the US especially, attacks on judges. The judges who do the right thing and make an appropriate intervention on a pack on social media by groups such as women's rights group, which is ironic because they believe that okay, only women are alienators, which is not true, it's gender blind, but they, it's convenient for them to get on the platform because who can argue with this? Well, I'm a feminist. Oh, all right, okay. And I believe that that judge is biased because he took my child away. Well, he didn't take a child away because you are a woman. He took your child away because you are an alien. Yeah. But that's convenient for go up. And judges can attack on social media. They cannot fight back, obviously. They can say, wait a minute, that's not the evidence which I saw in the court. They will stay silent. They can land that. And in the U.S., the judges have to contest elections. Imagine yourself being a judge and asked to do a really difficult decision, sending someone to jail, changing custody, creating controversy <coughs> in the media, and then being attacked for doing something, and it's election time. Do you want billboards going up in the local town? Do you want to do that, or do you want to just play it safe and say, very friend of the court, Go and try to make some sort of agreement. Let's adjourn the case for the next six months. That's a safe way out. Thankfully, the American Bar Association has created a task force to defend the judges against unjustified attacks on social media. And the task force looks at the cases, and if there's absolute misinformation out there, they reach out to the sites, ask them to provide a contrary and sort of counter opinion or a set of facts for what really happened in the case. And more judges are asking about it. Statewide, this uh, is a national task force, but the state bar appropriations have taken up the agenda as well and are signing up to defend the judges as well, which is uh, very helpful. So I would encourage people who are in jurisdictions that have skeptical judges, judges who seem to believe that doesn't exist, if they want to talk to the judges who have done this work, we have wrestled in these cases. We have tried to craft remedies that work. I'd be happy to put you in touch with those judges. Because they, at some point in time, are skeptical as well. But they now believe that alienation does exist. It's devastating. And there must be done something to calm it. 